It was a different kind of Passover meal to say the least. I remember right when I sat down, Philip leaned over to me and he whispers, Hey, Thomas, I feel like something special is going to happen tonight. I looked at him and said, I doubt it. I was wrong. Jesus got up from the table. He walked over, grabbed a basin of water and a towel. I remember at the time thinking to myself, what's Jesus going to do with the foot water? I doubt he's going to wash somebody's feet. I was wrong. He knelt down and began to wash Bartholomew's feet. Bart just sat there. Didn't say anything. He didn't move. None of us did. Jesus finished and went on to James and Andrew and all the rest of us. I remember at the time thinking, this is so strange, yet so wonderful. I doubt anyone is going to say anything right now. I was wrong. You know who broke the silence? Peter. No way you're going to wash our feet. That's what I told him. He could wash other people's feet, sure, but he wasn't going to wash mine. And so I said, Jesus, you are not going to wash my feet. I mean, you're the king. And he looked at me and then he said, well, then you can't have anything to do with me. And I'm like, ouch, okay, wash my feet, wash my hands, wash my whole body if you have to. He just looked at me and said, no, your feet will do just fine, Peter. In the midst of washing our feet, he taught us servanthood. Then Jesus took some of the bread and some of the wine. He blessed it and served it to us. He said it was a new covenant with his blood. And he said, tonight, all of you lose faith in me. I remember thinking right then, lose faith in you? Never. But I didn't say anything. I just sat there. I couldn't just sit there. I had to say something. So I looked at him and I said, Jesus, I love you. You can count on me. Everybody else may fall away, but I will not. You can count on me. He looked at me and he smiled and he said, Peter, you'll deny me three times before tomorrow morning. Ouch. Next thing I knew, we were wrapping things up and headed to the garden to pray. Once we got to the garden, it just all went crazy. Jesus asked me, Peter, and James to go with them farther into the garden to pray, of course. And we did, or at least we tried. We fell asleep, and Jesus had to keep coming to wake us up. I remember this one time, he came to wake us up and he said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And it's true, you know, it's true. And to think this is all because of Judas. Did he really think he was doing the right thing? There he is. That's the one we're looking for. The one who's praying all by himself. Now the others, they'll try to distract us, but don't let him. He's the one you're looking for. The one I will kiss on the cheek. Now, what about the price we agreed upon? The 30 pieces of silver? All right, remember, it's the one who I kiss on the cheek. A kiss. Judas betrayed Jesus with the kiss of friendship. It's got crazy after that. Peter picked up a sword and chopped the guy's ear off. And Jesus just, he just bent down and picked up the ear and put it right back on the guy's head as if nothing had ever even happened. And then of course they took Jesus away. And I want to tell you so badly that we fought for him, that I fought for him. But the truth is, is we all ran away. None of us stood up for Jesus. And I'm so ashamed of it. What have I done? What have I, what have I done? I just killed him. I just, I just crucified Jesus. I crucified Jesus. That's what the crowd wanted. That's what they got. Personally, I don't believe that man did anything to deserve what he got. But I'm just a soldier doing my job. When the governor gave his sentence, that's when I went to work. I loved that job. I felt like I was administering justice every time I nailed someone to a tree. But that man, that man, 
didn't deserve it. Makes no sense. There I was, rotting in a jail cell for murdering, stealing, you name it, I've probably done it. I knew the next time I stepped foot outside of that jail, that was it. So when the guards came and got me, and they put me next to this guy who was beaten to a pulp, and Governor Pilate started asking the crowd, which one of these men do you want me to set free? I mean, it was obvious. The crowd is going to say, let Jesus go. And then I was going to tell them where they could go. And then the crowd, they started chanting, Barabbas. I mean, they were saying my name. They were saying my name over and over again. The guards shoved me into the crowd and they took Jesus off to Golgotha. One minute, I'm a man marked for death. And the next minute, I'm free. It made no sense. So I followed him all the way to Golgotha. I was stationed at Golgotha that day. We had just raised the second criminal by the time they brought him to me. I'll never forget the way he looked. He had been beaten, spit on, whipped. He was unrecognizable as a man. Hideous, even. <sighs> what was left of his clothes were stripped, and he was thrown down on the cross, and then I went to work. The criminal normally wants to get away, so the first hand is always the hardest. They fight back. But something strange happened this time. He didn't fight back. I just assumed it was from exhaustion. And I've been called every name in the book. But this guy, he said something that I was completely unprepared for. He said to me, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And he forgave me. Forgive them. He said, forgive them. Who is he? Forgive? It should have been me up there. I was the one that was supposed to be hanging on that cross. He took my place. Then I looked up and I remember he took a deep, agonizing breath and he said, it is finished. Then he died. Surely, surely, this man, he was the son of God. Thank you.